Good evening, everyone. We appreciate your participation in this event. We hope you will enjoy it. During this series of lectures, we will listen to some of the most renowned language researchers in the world who will help us all expand our knowledge and vision of language and communication. Now we will present a general introduction of today's lecturer background. Good evening to everyone in the Western Hemisphere and good morning to everyone in the Eastern Hemisphere. We are delighted to welcome you again to our distinguished lectures at Escuela Nacional Preparatoria 3, Justo Sierra of the UNAM 2020-2021, the meaning of meaning. Today's lecturer is Professor Daniel Leonard Everett. Professor Everett is probably most well known for his work with the Piraha people in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, with whom he lived for about a total of eight years. His findings challenged the most basic tenets of the formalistic schools of linguistics of the 20th century. Initially, Professor Everett went to work with the Piraha people on December 10, 1977, as a member of SEAL International with the intention to translate the New Testament into their language and convert the Piraha people into good children of God. As it turned out, however, it was them who shook him and the foundations of our current understanding of language, cognition, and human behavior. Yet, after 15 years of discussion over the same argument, Professor Everett has decided to move on to other just as exciting topics of research, such as the unknown knowns of the human mind and the analysis of the evolution of language as a culturally motivated tool. Professor Everett has published more than 100 scientific articles and 11 books. His latest books are Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, Life and Language in the Amazon Jungle, 2009, Language, the Cultural Tool, 2012, Dark Matter of the Mind, the Culturally Articulated Unconscious, 2016, How Language Began, the Story of Humanity's Greatest Invention, 2016. And now, without further ado, please let me welcome Professor Daniel Leonard Everett to our distinguished lectures the Meaning of Meaning, with his lecture, The Evolution of Meaning in the Lower Paleolithic. Welcome, Professor Dan. Thank you very much for having me. It is a tremendous honor for me to be speaking to um, uh, faculty and students of UNAM. Uh, when I was a young boy, I was raised on the uh, border of California and Baja California, and um, um, I think I was about 11 years old before that I knew before I knew that Mexico was another country, because there were no boundaries in those days. Our family doctor was in Mexicali, and we we went across the border very frequently. In fact, every week. Um, and uh, I remember sitting in uh, our family doctor's office uh, in. Um, in Mexicali, and I saw a beautiful photo on his desk of this gorgeous building with these beautiful paintings and colors on it. And um, I asked him what that was, and he said, that's the university where I became, I took my medical training. It's the Universidad Autónoma de, de México. And so uh, uh, I was quite, I'm quite honored now to uh, have, have come all those years since I was a little boy in the doctor's office and speaking to people at UNAM. Um, I am uh, concerned these days with the uh, evolution of human language and with um, the nature of meaning in um, the field of semiotics. Um, so this talk uh, comes from my uh, book in part uh, on how language began, but it also is the result of ongoing research with archeologist Professor Larry Barham of the University of Liverpool in England. And Larry and I have published a large article following up on all of this research uh, with more archeological evidence. So um, I started off uh, studying with uh, Kenneth Pike who was with the Summer Institute of Linguistics and he himself did his PhD on 
uh, Mixteco uh, in Mexico. Um, I then moved to studying um, about and eventually studying with Noam Chomsky and Cartesian formal linguistics. Um, but I no longer work in these areas. I'm primarily concerned with the connections between language, cognition, and culture. So I have written uh, these books. Here's the Spanish version of Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. Um, and my two current projects, I'm writing a biography of uh, the philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce for Princeton University Press. And I'm writing a book entitled Percy and Linguistics for Oxford University Press. I hope to have that book done um, by this coming summer and the other book will be done next year, I hope. Um, so there are a lot of controversies about the origins of human beings and the origins of language. Um, and, and what I'm gonna be doing, what I'm gonna be talking about is didn't originate with me, but I think I've been the main defender of it in recent years which is that language began 1.5 million years ago with Homo erectus. Um, and this is very controversial because for example, the, the bulk of modern linguists who follow Noam Chomsky would say that language is much more recent. <clears throat> and as we'll see, the reasons for these differences have to do with um, what we take to be basic in language, meaning or grammar. And I'm going to argue that meaning is, is what language is all about. Um, so others, many people study language evolution and some look at the neurological development and cross species comparisons, uh, comparing, for example, chimpanzee abilities with human abilities, um, or looking at, at codes and birds and chimps and comparing those. Uh, others look for differences in the human brain, which are quite significant. In my book, How Language Began, I have a long section on, I think it's a four chapters on the human brain. And one of the important areas is neuronal density, how dense are our neurons packed, and what do these have to do with our ability to have language. Um, <clears throat> many people look at the archeological evidence, but it's particular paintings and other form of expression. Uh, paintings are an indication of a rich culture. We find paintings uh, uh, as old as, um, a couple of hundred thousand years. The first paintings we are aware of were done by Neanderthals, uh, Homo neanderthalensis. Um, but we're looking actually for symbolic evidence of meaning even, even much farther ago than, than paintings. <clears throat> um, there are a number of experiments that show that uh, um, there are word recognition areas of the brain that are found close to the areas of the brain where we store language. Uh, I won't be talking about that quite so much in this talk, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about language in the brain and once we've gotten through the basic evidence for language. Um, <clears throat> most, of the, most of the evidence that is used for uh, discussing uh, the evolution of language is largely uh, indirect. For example, we don't have any Homo erectus brains. We can't study their brains directly. We can look at their skulls um, uh, and infer things about their brains. But what we do have from Homo erectus are tools that uh, we have fossils of Homo erectus skulls and Homo erectus uh, skeleta, but we, we in particular have their tools. We, and we have the record of their travels and we have evidence from their settlements so that we can construct um, a, re a reasonably reliable picture of the cognitive abilities of the first human being. So any creature that's first called Homo, so Homo erectus, Homo neanderthal, insus, Homo sapiens, which we are, uh, in, but Homo means human. Uh, so so uh, they're human, we're human. We're just different species of humans. Um, we can, language is biocultural. There's aspects of language that require our biology, such as our speech apparatus and our brain. Other parts of language require culture. Uh, one thing I'm gonna argue in this uh, 
presentation or present for you uh, that I've talked about in my books is that um, meaning comes from culture. Without culture, we can't really construct uh, meaning. So for example, um, the Pita Haas who, who I've worked with have been, I, I first made the claim many years ago that they didn't count and they didn't even have the number one. They had no numbers whatsoever. This was very controversial. So psychologists from uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, from Stanford University, from Columbia University, from the University of Miami in Florida, uh, came down at different times to do their own experiments. And, and all of them agreed that I'm, you know, my claim is correct, the Pitaha don't have numbers, but it's not because of any cognitive inferiority. The reason Pitaha don't have numbers is the same reason that I do not have golf clubs. I don't play the game golf. I don't need golf clubs. These are tools that are not useful to me. And the Pitaha don't need numbers because they don't do things with numbers. Numbers are not a tool that are useful to them. So once we start to see certain areas of vocabulary and certain areas of language and language itself as tools, we began to understand a little bit more about the distribution of language, I believe, and some of the distinctions between languages of the world. And uh, this leads us to think about translation, for example. Is translation possible between any two languages? And the answer that I've given is no, it isn't. Translation is only possible uh, when two cultures are sufficiently aligned that you can get, you can find the meanings you want to translate in both cultures. But I could not translate uh, mathematical works into Pitaha because if you don't have numbers, um, you simply can't um, talk about math. And it, but on the other hand, there are many animals and understandings of animal behaviors that the Pitaha have that would be very difficult to translate for people who, who lack the experience and the knowledge of these kinds of animals. Um, archaeology is very important out of all the disciplines because it sort of lets us know how long ago things happened because we have dating methods. If we find a tool we can, in Africa, Larry, my, my uh, co-author does a lot of field research in Africa and he finds tools that are 500,000, even as old as 900,000 years old. And uh, these can be dated uh, through the help of others. And, and having these tools means that we can set a time frame for when things happen. Um, there's profound disagreement, interestingly enough, however, on what language is, what constitutes language. So before we can talk about how it evolved, we have to have some sort of foundational understanding of what language is. Chomsky's understanding of language is that it's a recursive grammar uh, system. Um, and it has certain properties that, are, that the recursion applies to. So Saussure would have defined, Ferdinand de Saussure would have defined language in a different way. And I'm going to define language in yet a different way. So when we think of all the ingredients we need to tell the story of the evolution of language, we need archaeology, we need linguistics, we need field research, semiotics, which I'll mention, comparative biology, philosophy, cognitive science, paleo neuroscience. You know, it takes a lot of information. It's hard, and and it requires a lot of people working together, which is is one of the great things about science and about knowledge um, is people working together uh, in the humanities, in the sciences, in education. It's very important that people work together. So one definition of language is a set of sentences described by a recursive grammar. That's roughly Ch Chomsky's um, definition of grammar, although Chomsky and I have argued so long that anything I say that I believe he said he denies it, and and it's pretty much the same. I tend to deny what, how he characterizes what I've said. So, uh, this is we've reached a we've reached an impasse so that we can uh, present our ideas, but dialogue has um, has sort of gotten unproductive. Um, I am going to call language the transfer of information by symbols, um, and that sounds really strange for people who've had 
linguistics um, uh, over the last you know 50 years because that doesn't sound like language, but I'm gonna to try to argue that that is what language is. So who has language? Well, for on the one hand, it's true that all entities in the world communicate. And here in Massachusetts, the trees are shedding their leaves. All the leaves, my yard is full of leaves that have fallen off the trees. Why do the trees do that? Because they get information from the external world. The days are getting shorter. The change in sunlight patterns triggers events inside the trees that causes them to go into a deep sleep for winter and shed their leaves. So this is a form of communication. But I wouldn't want to say that trees have language. Only, only humans appear to have language. So I'm going to repeat uh, the second definition and give you a, another one. I'm going to call communication the transfer of information by signs, any, any kind of sign. And language is the transfer of information by symbols in my definition. Now, I will try to explain what I mean by signs and symbols. Language is a subform of communication, therefore, because symbols are a subtype of signs. So signs basically, as I'm using it, uh, include icons, indexes, and symbols. Um, so language is a subtype of communication, but it's a very specialized type. And as far as we know, it exists natively only among humans. But what makes language so different from communication is the productive and cultural creation of symbols um, as the core of language. So here are the, here's a, some simple definitions of signs. An icon is a sign that resembles or corresponds to the thing that it refers to. So a photograph of me is an icon of me. A painting of you is an icon of you. A diagram of a sentence is an icon of that sentence. It corresponds to the sentence. There are parts of the diagram. Blueprints correspond to a house so that the architectural design of your house can be put on paper. That's not your house, but it corresponds to your house, and so it's an icon. An index is a sign that is connected physically to what it refers to. So if I see a footprint, I know that was caused physically by whatever caused, made the footprint. If I smell smoke, I know that was caused physically by fire. If I smell uh, cochinita pibil, then I know that was, the smell was caused by the molecules of cochinita pibil coming out and hitting my nose. There's a physical connection. If I point to something, there is an imaginary physical connection between my finger and the thing that I'm, I'm pointing to. So a sign is roughly connected physically to the thing it refers to, but a symbol is a sign that picks out what it refers to usually by convention. And I'm gonna simplify here and say by convention. So a dog in English means canine because English speakers at some point in their history agreed that it does, but canine in, in Spanish is perro because people, native speakers of Spanish, uh, in, in a sense, culturally as, as it evolved, uh, call, call perro uh, for canine. And in Portuguese, it's cachorro. And in Pidaha, it's neopai. Um, Pidaha. So these are Pidaha, uh, neopai. So it's a, um, it is a, um, <clears throat> an agreement that we have. It's, it's a convention. So the threshold to symbols was likely sudden. When, when did people get hum, humans get symbols? Well, we needed a brain big enough and rich enough and complex enough to be able to recognize them. But the evolution of different platforms for language took quite some time. And in, you know, so we have to have intentions. We have to have the ability to uh, see things against the background. There are a lot of things we need to have language that we share with many other creatures, but only humans have language because only humans got to the point of a brain that was able to create symbols. So again, one view is that language is about 200,000 years old. My view is that language is more like 60,000 generation or generations old or more than 1 million years old. All of us who have studied linguistics know that speech is secondary. Language is primary. 
Um, so you can have a language even if you don't have a mouth or even if your vocal apparatus was destroyed or you don't have the ability to control it or you can't hear it. If you're deaf, you can use, you can make signs. Languages of signs are perfectly good languages. Um, and in Pita Ha, you can whistle your language or you can hum your language or you can speak it with very few sounds. So speech helps us communicate language. It helps us to uh, convey th the language of symbols that our culture has given us. Um, it's secondary. How many sounds do we need for a language? Well, if you think about the computers, I'm, I'm talking to you through a computer and uh, I have created this PowerPoint via a computer, but computers really only have two letters. They have one and zero. And everything that needs to be said to a computer has to be first put into ones and zeros. Fortunately, we don't have to learn how to do that. Um, the computer operating system does that for us. Um, and the word processing programs do this for us. Um, but um, uh, it just shows that you, you only need a small number of sounds to be able to have a, a sufficient speech for language. Um, I say that because there are some people who doubt that Erectus could have made, Homo erectus 1.5 million years ago, could have made all the sounds that we made. It's irrelevant if they could not have done that because they could still have had language. And some are coming to believe that in fact, they could produce all the sounds that we can produce. Um, it, it's, it's great if they can, but if they couldn't, it doesn't mean they didn't have language. Uh, we find certain vowels such as I, A, U in all the world's languages, E, A, U. Uh, they're found in all the world's languages. They're the easiest ones to hear because they're the best separated in the mouth. Um, and it has been argued by Phil Lieberman uh, and Jeffrey Lightman that, um, that the major part of the human vocal apparatus that evolved was the tongue moving back in the mouth in order to produce the vowels E, A, U. Um, so evolution wanted us to be able to make these clear sounding vowels. Uh, and so we evolved to be able to do that. That's one perspective. Tecumseh Fitch, whom I've debated um, many places at different times, um, doesn't agree with this. But for the story that I want to tell, it really doesn't matter because speech is secondary and language is primary. So this is our hero. This is the guy we want to talk about, the, the people, Homo erectus, a, a group of humans who were hunter-gatherers who roamed around the world, who left Africa uh, almost 2 million years ago, and within just a short period of time, were all over the world. Um, um, not the new world as far as we know right now, but they were in Beijing, they were in Europe, they were in um, uh, Africa, they were in um, the Middle East, they were all over the world. And when they came to bodies of water, when they came to the ocean, it wasn't a barrier. The evidence suggests that they built boats and sailed across to different lands. Uh, they didn't get as far as Australia. Uh, and they, as far as we know, they didn't get to the New World, but they traveled extensively. Homo erectus was an interesting person, creature. They were um, about five foot 11. They were taller or just as tall as modern humans. Uh, what is that? That's about 1.8 uh, meters. Um, uh, and they, um, their brains were about 950 cc's. Um, our brains, modern humans, about 1,250 to 1,300. But some modern European females have brains around 950 cc's. And we know that the size of the brain doesn't indicate intelligence directly. It's how many neurons are in the brain. So the fact that their brains were smaller um, probably means they weren't as intelligent as we are, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, Homo erectus was wide ranging, as we said, all over the world. Polymorphic, they had various different, you know, we're a polymorphic species. Not every human being looks alike. We, we can vary tremendously in our appearances and, and erectus could too. Um, they, erectus was an ocean traveler, a tool maker, a uh, cultural being. Erectus invented the controlled use of fire um, and had communities that uh, accomplished quite a bit. 
And so um, one argument for language in Homo erectus is indirect. It's not clear that they could have done all the things they did without language. So there are opposing views to how language came about. Some believe that it is gradual. That's my view. That would be Charles Darwin's view that language sort of came about gradually. Um, other people um, such as Chomsky would say that language just came about very suddenly and that natural selection really doesn't explain how language came about. Uh, some people say that language is grammar and some people say it's symbols. Uh, some people say that language is uniquely human or it is a, um, there are a number of abilities that humans share with other animals that um, we just do better than those other animals. Um, so if we look here at the evolution of the brain and we look at different species, so we have Homo sapiens sapiens, this diamond shape, you know, the biggest brain, but we find um, Homo erectus within this circle and we find a few of the squares of Homo erectus uh, right in the range of um, modern humans. The thing is we have a huge sample of modern human uh, brains and skulls. We have a very, very small sample of Homo erectus uh, skulls. So we find some of their uh, skull sizes around 1200 and we find some that are as low as 800. So there's a lot of variation there. Um, and you know, a lot of people like to use um, um, services like 23andMe to trace their genetic heritage to see where they're from. So I know that um, I've done this. I have, I've looked at my, my uh, genetic background and I know that I have a teeny little bit of um, Ashkenazi Jew, uh, you know, like one tenth of one percent. And I have a very small amount of, um, of uh, Latin heritage, but, um, and I have like 2% Neanderthal and most, the rest of 96% of all my genes are from Northern Europe, as you would guess by looking at me. Um, however, you can, do the, you can do the same test and find different backgrounds, but ultimately all of us, everyone watching this, all of us alive in the world today, go back to Africa to Homo erectus. Homo erectus was the ancestor of us all. We all go back to that. We are all Africans. <clears throat> there, so we don't know what the crucial brain threshold is for erectus to have language, uh, for any species to have language, but erectus seems to have, have crossed that. But they needed to have a brain that could create a productive, culturally accepted uh, symbol system and they had to have the memory to re remember the symbols. It, it doesn't do any good to have a language if you can't remember any of the words, right? I mean, it does some good. And there are people who suffer certain kinds of aphasia that in fact, they can produce the grammar, but they don't have the words. And there are other kinds of aphasia where they seem to have the words, but they can't put them together in a meaningful way. So uh, we're looking at what brains, you know, have to be like to have language and and uh, I'm not looking at that directly, but I'm informed by people who, who do look at this to some degree. Now, I just wanna briefly talk about Charles Sanders Peirce because no one who is concerned about meaning can talk about meaning without have some background. In the background, you know there was this guy, Charles Sanders Peirce. He invented formal logic before Frege. Um, so he was working in formal logic about 1865, and then Frege came along with formal logic in 1870, and Peirce developed his further. Uh, neither Frege nor Peirce knew of each other, but Peirce had already invented formal logic by the, um, just by about 1865 or so. He invented semiotics before Saussure um, in 1867. He invented pragmatism, the American school of philosophy that probably the only school of philosophy ever developed in the United States, pragmatism. Um, very often people think of William James as the founder of pragmatism, but William James got that idea and was a good friend of and colleague of Peirce's. Peirce is the inventor of that. During his lifetime, Peirce was considered America's greatest mathematician. 
and he made fundamental discoveries in mathematics and chemistry. His, his only degree actually was in chemistry, and his only job was a geophysicist. Um, and he worked in geology, astronomy. The only book he ever published was in astronomy. Um, he was um, uh, somewhat uh, arrogant, um, and he started off life wealthy and ended life very poor uh, with nothing. Uh, he would go days without eating. He died of, um, of stomach cancer or of intestinal cancer, but he worked up until just a couple of days before he died, producing beautiful uh, things. Okay, so Peirce created this idea of semiotics that we're going to appeal to, and I talk about dark matter of the mind, which is how we interpret the world around us, and it's built from our experiences. I won't go into detail about that. I've got an entire book on the subject, and uh, you know, I have many other talks that I give on dark matter of the mind, but it's a very important thing, how we interpret the world, and with, by not even knowing some of the ways that we interpret the world. So, for example, if I'm walking down I'm walking in the jungle with somebody from the Pitaha, and I see a branch of a tree moving very quickly. I don't know what caused that. It could have been uh, the wind. It could have been a monkey. It could have been any number of things. But my Pitaha friend walking with me will know exactly what caused that because they have knowledge, background knowledge, knowledge they've acquired as children from being taught, from observing, from uh, living. Um, that that was a monkey, for example. And they find my question, what was that? Simply an ex uh, a demonstration of the fact that I was raised in another environment. I define culture as an abstract network shaping and connecting social roles, hierarchically structured knowledge domains and ranked values. So let's, uh, ranked values is, we talk about cultures sharing similar values. So Right now in the US, and I'm sure in Mexico as well, there are people who are against restrictions to protect us from COVID and believe we should have greater freedom. And there are people who think we should cut back on our freedom to protect ourselves from COVID. So um, let's say that every American or every Mexican has the value of freedom and the value of uh, health and safety. Now, if freedom is more important to you than prevention of COVID, that, so you have those two values and freedom is most important, then you're not going to want to wear a mask. Maybe you're not going to want to have social distancing. Uh, but if prevention is more important than freedom, you say, I'm willing to give up some of my freedom uh, in order to protect myself and protect you from getting this, this disease. Um, I'm not saying one is better. I just know that I'm not going to hang around with anybody who takes freedom as more important than preventing disease right now. But um, those are just, we, we both have those values, but I rank them one way and they rank them another way. And this is important for understanding culture. I'll skip the bit there. So now I want to get onto tools and, and start to work from tools into meaning. Tools are themselves social conventions. They are individual devices or processes that meet perceived needs of individuals and communities. Your language is a tool, your pencil is a tool, your clothes are tools, um, your um, toothbrush is a tool. We have all these different tools in our lives. Our lives revolve around tools. We take good care of our tools. I'm talking to you through a little laptop, which is one of my most important tools in today's world, my, my computer. Um, and these all come to have meaning for us. They represent things to us, right? So um, um, how do they come to do this? This is the problem. And this is the intellectual problem we set for ourselves. How, how do tools come to have these meanings? And how can we see evidence for meaning in tools that have been abandoned by their owners for 500,000 years? Um, that's quite interesting. Um, I noticed that one of the uh, one of the ways that your um, set of meetings right now is discussed is the meaning of meaning. Uh, this phrase was the title of a book by uh, Ogden and Richards, and their book was in part uh, inspired by Peirce, and they have a chapter in that book, uh, one of the first introductions to Peirce ever given um, in English. So tools are also a set of devices, processes, and expertise used to harness the properties of particular material. Um, 
their full culturally constructed repertoire of the knowledge, conventions, devices, and processes that we use, all of our tools. Um, and so tools are very complex. They're a very important part of our cognition. There are some people who would say that my mind is actually seen in my computer. My computer is an actual extension of my mind. So our tools become extensions of who we are. Human technology takes the ideas and turns them into material. They, it enmeshes the material with the ideational. Uh, human technology is the result of social construction, constructivism. Tools become symbols as they emerge from the values, the knowledge structures and social roles of a particular culture. That is, in my definition, they, they uh, become symbols as they emerge from culture. Um, <clears throat> so learning of technical skills takes place using a combination of language, gesture, imitation, and guided intervention. Uh, one of the interesting things is some of the stone tools that are made by, that were made by Homo erectus, they look very simple. They just look like rocks, but lab experiments with, um, PhD students around the world learning to use these special stone tools. Uh, indicate that it takes four to 500 hours for many of these, 500 hours for a PhD student to learn to make a stone tool that to the uneducated eye looks like a rock. Um, I've In the Amazon, I've seen people make tools that can seem simple. So among the Banawa people of the Amazon, I've watched them make blowguns and I've gone with them to the jungle to collect all the material to make poison to put on the darts that they put in the blowguns. And um, as they do it, and as little children learn from their fathers how to make these blowguns and the darts and do all this, there's very little language. There's mainly observation, but there is language um, and it comes at crucial moments. So it's not possible to do these things without that minimal amount of language. And I think the evidence suggests uh, that, you know, for example, for PhD students learning to make some of these tools, that were made over a million years ago, they need language too. So it's, it's very likely, it's, it's almost inescapable that Homo erectus needed language for building the tools. But I'm not gonna make that the case, the, the center of my case, I'm gonna make the case that the tools themselves became symbols as they do for us. Um, every, every sign has an object. So um, if I say the word dog in English, the object of that, is dog, you know, uh, a canine. Um, the representation of that object is are the letters D O G, and my interpretation is to link those letters with that um, canine, with that animal, and, and the interpretation. Then uh, this gets more complicated. I won't go into all the aspects of semiotics, but those are the basic ingredients. And we want to see these basic ingredients and tools. And once we can see that, once we can see these basic ingredients and tools and evidence for culture and Homo erectus, we're pretty sure they had meaning. And if they had that, we're pretty sure they had language. Um, <clears throat> so um, I've been over what these are. Um, so if you have uh, the claim that I'm making is that symbols are the prerequisites for language. Um, Symbols are necessary for language. Without symbols, there can be no language. So finding evidence for grammar doesn't mean there's a language. Uh, actually, we find grammatical uh, properties in, in bird communication. We find it in DNA communication. You know, how the, we have these new vaccines appearing for COVID that are based on um, messenger RNA. And messenger RNA is exactly what it says. It's a message. It takes a message um, to help build proteins. <clears throat> and, um, and, and it does this by a certain syntax and a certain, uh, and certain kinds of signs. Uh, so here, these are interesting. These are indexes. These are 3.7 million years old. These are footprints almost 4 million years old. In Africa, they were left by two Australopithecines. You can see the bigger footprint of the parent and the smaller footprint of the child. And this is the Australopithecine. They, they were walking there right after they walked there, it rained and this was a type of soil that was volcanic ash that almost immediately turned to concrete. Then it was covered and protected 
and discovered 3.7 mil million years later. Australopithecines have a brain about the size of a chimpanzee, but they walked upright and their brain was much more complicated and they were capable of much more complicated behaviors than chimpanzees. Now here's an icon. This is three million years old. This is older than human beings. This is collected by an Australopithecine, the same one whose picture we just saw. Um, and what looks funny about it? This is a pebble that's about, if you can see my hand, it's, um, it is about um, uh, two to three inches uh, in diameter. And um, it's not a rock that's normally found around the cave where these Australopithecines lived. Uh, it was collected some miles away. We know more or less where they got it because those stones still exist there today. And it was carried by them up to these caves because everyone most people agree it looked like a human face. You see the place for two eyes and a mouth. It looks almost like a smiley face, and this almost looks like hair. So um, this is the first example in the fossil record we have of one creature contemplating an icon. So the Australopithecines carried this up to the cave, um, and the best uh, explanation we have for why they did that is because it looked like a face. And they made tools. They made simple tools. These 3.3 million years old uh, tools is basically just splitting a rock. Um, chimpanzees can do this as well. Uh, so we, we're tempted to say this, these could have taken on symbolic meaning for them, but we don't have evidence that Australopithecines had a brain uh, big enough to recognize or, or rich enough to recognize symbols. We also don't know that Australopithecines had a culture rich enough to, to help create meaning. So they have these tools, but they're not tools like the earliest humans. Uh, here's another example of an icon. And here's an example, a really interesting example of, a, of tools that are used as symbols. So the hammer and the sickle. Um, these, the hammer is this, to the owner of the hammer is the symbol of of their work. It's an index of their work. It's an icon of certain, of other hammers. Uh, the sickle is at one time, you know, it's it's at least an index of cutting grain in the field. It's also um, an icon of other uh, uh, sickles, um, but it is also a symbol of an economic system. And so the hammer and the sickle together become a symbol of an economic uh, system based on the power of labor in the factory and labor in the field. Um, so, so we have evidence that, um, that tools, and we, we haven't seen much of it yet. We're going to see it. Um, but what I want to say is once you get a symbol, how, how much, what else do you need? And the answer is you really only need a little bit of grammar to go along with the symbol. Uh, and one form of grammar is what I call a G1 grammar, which is just symbols placed in a linear order. And, um, in effect, I've worked with languages, Pinaha is fairly similar to that. They don't have a complex sentence. They have simply uh, words that are put in a row uh, for very short sentences. There's no evidence for a phrase structure like verb phrases or, or anything like that. So these are G1 grammars. Actually, you can see G1 grammars even today. When you type a series of emojis on your phone, and send them to somebody else. You just have a set of symbols in an order, in a linear order, and and people can interpret it. You send it off to them. Uh, so emojis, uh, in a very interesting way, seem to be replicating the origin of human language um, uh, by simply taking symbols and putting them in order and transmitting them. In my analysis and my theory, a G2 grammar allows structures with hierarchy. They, they can get phrase structures. You can get verb phrases and noun phrases, but not recursive structures. So um, you don't get verb phrases within verb phrases or sentences within sentences or noun phrases within noun phrases as you do in English and Spanish. And a G3 grammar allows linear order, uh, hierarchy and recursion. Now, here's the interesting thing. If we admit that meaning takes place in the brain, 
then you don't need it to be totally reflected in the syntax or the morphology of the language. We can simply, so in a sense, G1 grammars and G3 grammars have the same complexity of meaning, but it's reflected um, less directly in a G1 grammar. So if I say, John spoke, Mary is here. I can interpret that as John said that Mary is here, or I can interpret that as John said something and Mary is here as two separate events. Um, but the fact that I can interpret it as one sentence, John said that Mary is here, but it really in the syntactic least says John spoke, Mary is here, means that the grammar doesn't have to directly reflect the semantics. We see that with emojis. We see people putting together emojis, these little symbols in a row, and we, we impose on them rich interpretations that are not found in the emojis by themselves. And, and we see this all around us. For example, if, um, if somebody's talking too long, as I may be doing now, and we're sitting in a big uh, auditorium, two people sitting in the back, they won't have to say anything. They can look at each other and raise their eyebrows and sort of point to the door with their head. And one can shake his head, yes, and they both shake their head, yes, and they leave. So there's no grammar there. I mean, there's a, there, except for a linear order of symbols, the symbol of shaking your head up and down, the symbol or the index of pointing to the, to the door. Uh, so we do a lot of com communication that uses only signs in a particular order, but without a lot of grammar. Uh, we can use a lot of grammar as speakers of languages that have very rich grammars, but we don't have to. And the main reason our grammars are rich is to have a more direct content contact with meaning. The point is meaning is complex always. Grammar doesn't always have to be complex. Humans can represent anything. So the first erectus icon that we find uh, about 450,000 years ago in Morocco is this phallic shaped uh, bone. It's actually a bone from a cuttlefish uh, and they carried it around with them. When we get into tools, now we saw the stone tools of, um, of Australopithecines and chimpanzees, but look at this ax. This is a beautiful ax. From uh, that would have you could have found this on the ground 1.8 million years ago. An axe like this, it's refined. It's called uh, part of the Acheulean culture, which was from 1.8 million to 200,000 years ago, and it is takes a lot of work. Now, when you see this kind of tool, you realize, oh, this would have taken a long time to learn how to make this. It's not just breaking a rock. And so, what we find um, here's. Uh, Larry Barham and I were in Larry's office in Liverpool, and we were looking at some tools that he had just brought back from Africa, 500,000-year-old tools like this. And uh, a colleague of his, who also works on Homo erectus, walked into Larry's office while we were talking and said, oh, those are West African stone axes. I usually work with East Afrin African stone axes, and you can tell them apart. So already, 500,000 years ago, there were there were fine cultural distinctions between these tools that showed their origin. We also find in the tools that Homo erectus made, tools like this, that they involved stylistic variants. A stylistic variant is a variant that simply shows something about the owner and it's not required for the tool to work. So sometimes they put little uh, humps on the tools that as far as we can tell, were simply to make them look more attractive or show that the person who did them had a certain level of skill. So they were representing things uh, through their tools. Um, and so to make a tool like this, you have to be able to have imagination, you need intention, you need planning, you need memory, you need to know that all of these arrows represent parts of the tool that you will have to cut out of the rock before the tool will function as you would like it to function. And so Homo erectus, besides having a controlled use of fire, had pre-shaping of stone tools. They, had, they would get a big rock and they would have to think about the tool that's inside. It's almost like sculpt, uh, being Michelangelo of, of tools. And we also know that they used wood tools and they had bone tools. Um, and, they, and, and this, this kind of tool, um, if, if you know more about tools um, and tool shaping uh, this time, 
this required language. Almost every single uh, um, archaeologist agrees this is a special kind of tool called the Levallois technology. And um, no one has been able to learn how to make Levallois tools that we know of without language. They're very complex and they require a lot more planning, even than that beautiful axe that I showed you earlier. Um, and so these innovations, so here, this, if you were just walking along and you hit your toe on this rock, you would think, oh, it's just a rock. Uh, but in fact, it's an ax and it required a great deal of um, effort. And, and these are quite old. Um, uh, I won't go into all the evidence for tools. I'll give you some more examples of hand axes, of cleavers, of picks. These are all separate tools that require different technologies to make. So these are the first kinds of tools that Homo erectus made, Acheulean tools of more than a million years ago. But then they moved eventually to these Levallois tools that are, are much, much more difficult, much more complicated. They were doing these about a million years ago and, and, and more recently. Um, and these show, um, by the way that they cared for them, the way that they carried them, the way that they anticipated their moves and carried these tools with them, the kind of planning that it took to make the tools, the fact that they were associated with some settlements and not others. This is very suggestive of symbolic use, use of tools, that these tools actually began to take on. They were indexes of what they were for. They were, you know, the it's like pointing to the task. I'm going to have to cut something with this. They were icons of other tools. You can use this as a model to make other tools, but they were also symbols of the particular group. They were symbols of the particular activity. Um, and, and so there's very strong evidence here for symbolism uh, among Erectus. Uh, another example of all the steps they had to follow to make these things. Um, what else do we find from Erectus? Uh, so so let's, uh, let's grant that the evidence is that they not only had complex tools, but these tools were evidence, are evidence that they had symbolic meaning. Uh, we find this 750,000 year old shell uh, in Java, modern day Java. And you can see these designs on it, these geometrical shapes. These were formed probably, almost certainly, by someone holding the tooth of a shark and pressing down very hard on the shell. And people who studied this shell and this type of uh, activity of Homo erectus argue that they didn't pick it up. They made all of these before they lifted their hand one time. This was an intentional act. They were trying almost certainly to represent something. This, I mean, we can't prove that, right? You can't. But, but they also did it on rocks. They didn't just make these symbols on shells, they made them on rocks. Um, and they're, they're, so apparently there's something here that, that they're trying to represent. This is a lot of effort and, and there's an attempt to represent something. There's some sort of sign involved here. Um, I got interested in Homo erectus because I was in Jerusalem at the Israeli Museum and I saw this in the in one of the displays. It's called the Venus of Berakat Ram, and it is over 250,000 years old. And when uh, the museum said this is the oldest art known to human beings, it's 250,000 years old. I thought that's impossible. There were no, you know, Homo sapiens wasn't around Israel 250,000 years old. 250,000 years ago. But in fact, these were made by Homo erectus and we have evidence of, of cutting. We have evidence of, of dyeing, uh, use, use of ochre. Uh, so this was uh, symbolic. This is art that was not just iconic, but in conjunction with what we know about their tools was symbolic. So erectus tools had symbolic and social components. They were simultaneously indexes, icons, and symbols. Uh, as soon as you get symbols and you put them in a linear order, you know, uh, John, Mary, Saw, um, you have language. You are able to express uh, just anything. Uh, in fact, they're, you know, mathematical linguists can show that as soon as you can get symbols in a linear order, you can say anything that you can say in any other language, um, as long as the cultures match to a certain degree. So the leap to grammar is far smaller 
than the leap to symbols because grammar can just be linear order. But symbols, that's the real big leap. And we, uh, we have to find evidence for that in the archeological record. And with Homo erectus, we do find it. Um, so um, <clears throat> initially we simply have symbols in linear order like we're seeing with emojis today. Uh, I get, you know, I have uh, several grandchildren and I'm getting texts from them every day and I don't always know how to interpret them because I don't know what all these emojis mean. I've got to look it up, but I get just like a series of little emojis and I'm thinking, you know, my grandchildren are like Homo erectus. Um, there's a natural iconic representation of these, um, these meanings. Um, so then how do we get from that to the full language that we have today? Well, um, one researcher, Luke Steele, has argued that, um, and I have argued in How Language Began and in my book, Language, the Cultural Tool, that once we get symbols in a linear order, we can start enhancing them. We can start adding things like tense and aspect and color words. We can have um, enhancements of the way that we interpret them using pragmatic information and semantic information. But the meaning is what is core to all of this. The symbols represent semantics. They represent um, th the threshold of modern cultural meaning, much more sophisticated meaning. Um, and, and once we have that, we can start to enhance it. We can get rules and structure of syntax. How complex does it have to be? Well, um, let's think of uh, Spanish verbs, Portuguese verbs, and Pidaha verbs and English verbs. English is a modern language. Um, probably we don't want to say it's a primitive language, but how many verb forms are there in English? Well, there are five. Sing, sang, sung, singing, sings. That's it. How many verb forms does a Spanish verb have? Well, uh, I haven't counted, but let's, let's say 35 to 55. Um, it has a lot of forms of the subjunctive and the, the past subjunctive, future subjunctive, and the indicative and the preterite, uh, past preterite, and, and all these uh, uh, different verb forms. In pitaha, every verb has at least 16 uh, possible suffixes. So every pitaha verb has about 65,000 possible forms. That is fascinating. So if I told the pitaha, if a pitaha linguist was studying English and, and went back and published a paper in pitaha for the pitaha that English only has five verb forms, P there would be some pitaha that would say, well, that's racist. Surely they have more than that. You're saying they speak such a, that English is such a primitive language compared to ours. Um, and the pitaha linguist would say, actually, they can say whatever we can say with only five verb forms. And it would be really hard for other pitahas to understand that. So when we think of a language as complex or primitive, this is really just the eye of the beholder. Um, Languages evolve to fit the needs of their culture. And once they can do that, once they have meaning, they can always be expanded. Because remember that language doesn't exist apart from human beings and cultures. As cultures change, um, languages change. If, if you look at many languages today that use numbers that were borrowed from other languages, um, so many, many groups of Australia, Australian Aborigines, use number words from English, that doesn't mean they're they're primitive or less intelligent than English speakers. It simply means that they went through a long period of history where they didn't need any numbers and now they need numbers. And so they just borrowed some from the environment around them. Uh, it's what we all, it's what we all do. I mean, English is about 55% of the average words used in uh, English are, come from French or Latin. Um, so uh, English is a form of, you know, it's a kind of pidgin language. It's a mixture of other languages. And in the 12th century, English almost went extinct. It came back from the brink. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it doesn't have, and, and so today we find elements of German and English, we find elements of French, we find elements of Latin and many other languages uh, in English. It just shows that, you um, um, languages are cultural creations and cultures borrow from different places. So uh, you had uh, Randy LaPaula speak to you. Randy and um, my, uh, a good friend of mine, Robert Van Balen, developed a theory called role and reference grammar. Um, and uh, 
This is how you would represent a sentence in role and reference grammar. But what you have on the bottom are the symbols, the words in a particular linear order. And then what you have on top are structures that the sentence begins to take over its history that uh, facilitate interpretation. The structures of syntax make it easier to interpret sentences unambiguously. You don't need as much context because you have uh, linguistic constraints on what's being said. So syntax um, is, is not, complex syntax is not crucial for language, recursion is not crucial for language, but it, it is a help. It's a, it is a support mechanism for meaning. So, so the picture there is that <clears throat> the primary uh, core of language is symbols and meaning and grammar and morphology and intonation and all of these things help that. Um, and we can go on building from there. But the, the basic um, fact is that um, all of these things, gestures and intonation and, and things help us with meaning. Homo erectus was all over the world. They were um, in Iran one million years ago, in Pakistan a million years ago, in the Middle East almost two million years ago. And there's a um, settlement in it, modern day Israel, Gesher Benat Yaakov, by Homo erectus at 750,000 years old. And we know that they were in Israel at this time. And we know that they had this settlement that had one part for processing, one area for processing animal products, one area for processing plants, one area primarily for socializing, and one area for processing, I think, fish. So um, uh, they had an organized settlement 750,000 years ago. We know that they traveled by ocean from Indonesia to the island of Flores. Um, we know that they traveled to the island of Socotra about 1.4 million years ago off of Yemen, um, 150 miles. You couldn't see it from shore. They needed boats to get there. We know this because of settlement evidence we find on that island. We know that they had fancy stone axes like this one on the right called Excalibur found with this Homo erectus skull in Spain uh, that suggests that they had burial rites, they had understanding of death and representing um, symbolic um, tools um, for, for recognizing death. They made wooden spears. These are called the Shunigan spears. They're 450,000 years old. And for an erectus to see that, um, the erectus person would have known that this is a spear for throwing and there are other spears they made for thrusting. Um, so they just seeing this, they would know where it came from. The, it, 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 it would be indexical, iconic and symbolic. Um, so the evidence that we have suggests that Erectus had symbols and language 1.5 million years ago. There were separate bands, there were tool dialects, they made different kinds of tools there must, and there were language dialects almost certainly. Um, and um, so this would mean that language is far older than we had thought, that Neanderthals and sapiens, us, were already born into a linguistic world. When the first Homo sapiens appeared, when the first Homo neanderthalensis appeared, they were already hearing language because Homo erectus already had language. <clears throat> and so here's uh, a picture of the development of, of uh, our species, our genus, beginning with Gibbons to Australopithecines, Homo habilis, Homo ergaster, or Homo uh, erectus, and Homo sapiens. And I like this because it shows us, as, it shows the female side. And I teach a class regularly on human evolution, and um, I, I give evidence from the human body that uh, males are basically just start off as females, and then uh, genetic information and, and hormones take the female body and make it into a male body. But the basic building block for humans is the female body. Um, so I'm going to end there and see if there are questions. And thank you for your patience. Um, uh, and, and we'll see now if you have questions. This is my uh, personal library behind me, of course. I don't, uh, um, I like screen uh, savers. <laughs> Fascinating, um, Professor Dan. Um, I am pretty sure that if we could all applaud, clap, we good. But 
uh, it's difficult right now to coordinate uh, all the microphones. Uh, yet, um, I think we do already have one question. If you would like to check the chat, um, or if you want me to read for you. Um, okay, so is meaning complex? This is, if I'm understanding this, it's from Atenas Garcia Gomez. Um, is meaning complex in itself, or does the way language has evolved make it complex? Um, meaning starts off already as complex. It's an activity of interpreting the world around us the sim through symbols. So that is complex. But as our cultures evolve, and as we add these different en enhancements to language that I was talking about, um, we can ex um, express more easily com more complex meanings. This doesn't mean that meaning itself has become more complex. It just means that it's become easier as our grammars evolve evolve to express complex meanings and to get at complex meanings. Um, and the other question is, how do we connect the evolution of language with the evolution of inferential cognitive processes that mediate meaning? Well, what we're looking for is concrete evidence in the archeological record and in the physical record of the development of the Homo sapiens skull and body that would enable us to match things up and say, Oh, just at the time we're starting to see symbols of this type in the archaeological record, we're starting to see brain developments and, act, and, and enlargements in certain parts of the skull that are associated with particular kinds of inference. But um, once we have culture, we're already showing evidence for doing these inferences. When Erectus sailed across the, the water, they had to build boats, they had to plan, they had to make all sorts of inferential judgments. So we're seeing also in that archeological record, other evidence of complex cognitive processes that we would expect to see along with language. Um, there, is a, there is a question uh, from Sophia Barajas. Are we going back to Homo erectus grammar one with the use of emojis and digital language? Um, I wouldn't want to say that exactly, but it's reminiscent. Uh, emojis and linear order. All that shows us is not that our language is getting more primitive, but we can express complicated meanings with very simple grammars. Uh, putting emojis in an order, you know, with no phrase, no verb phrases for emojis, uh, none of that, we can still express quite a bit, of, quite a few things. Um, and so it's just uh, supporting evidence that we don't need as much grammar as we might think we do to communicate uh, meaning. Um, another question uh, from Aime Martinez Flores, what's the relation between neurological studies and the evolution of language? Well, uh, there are some really interesting neurological studies being done at MIT right now by my colleague, by my friend, uh, Evelina Fedorenko. And what she has shown is that uh, through experiments with many languages and, and hundreds of uh, speakers, that there is a network in the brain that is used to store our linguistic knowledge. She doesn't necessarily believe that that's evidence that language is innate, but she does show that language is stored across all people and across all languages in this same kind of network. But here's the interesting thing. That network is sensitive to meaning more than it is to grammar. So the primary component uh, building block of the human language network is, is symbolic. It's symbols, uh, word meanings, and, and secondarily sentences. So I, I was very excited when I started reading Evelina's work in this respect because it is, in, in a sense, um, exactly what we would predict, that meaning came first, we evolved for meaning, that we find areas in the brain for language, but they're built mainly around meanings with grammar as secondary. Um, so, so let's see, I, I don't get, uh, let, let me, let me go back up. The questions are coming in fast now. So, um, from, uh, uh, Sit Lali Martinez, uh, so the enhancers come after, uh, tone emphasis, um, yes, they, they would come after in this, uh, in the model that I'm proposing, um, and they have huge impact on communication, even though they come afterwards, because, when we have symbols, the way to interpret them is to know which symbols go with which symbols and which symbols are more important than other symbols. And so tone, intonation, um, gestures, all of these things 
focus on certain symbols and their groupings, and they make it easier to interpret the full amount of information that's being transmitted. So in other words, um, when we interpret a single word, and we're not exactly sure of the intonation, we use context. Uh, and context is very, it's okay. We can use context to interpret sentences, but it's not nearly as precise as having more cues built into the sentence itself. So once we start to get language and we can use context, building additional cues through sentence structure, more complex sentence structure, tones, intonation, all of this uh, simply, it, it in effect simplifies the task of getting meaning. So this all makes sense if you see meaning as the core of language and grammar as a support mechanism for making ink, uh, meaning more easy to, um, to understand. Um, so there's another question about this. I don't get how complex meaning can be conveyed through grammar and linear order. Uh, grammar and linear order can cause a lot of ambiguity, right? Absolutely. So one of the, so even though we can interpret um, uh, a sentence uh, like John, Mary, saw, this is ambiguous. This can mean many things. The most common interpretation we would get is that John saw Mary, but there could be other interpretations. So, so when we, ha the simpler the grammar, the more difficult it is to interpret, the, the more ambiguous the sentence becomes. So more grammar removes ambiguity and makes it easier to get at meaning. The grammar is not essential. It just makes our job easier. Uh, so even though we have complex grammar and nobody wants to learn grammar in school, and when you teach people English grammar, they're not terribly happy about it, that's actually helping them to get the meaning out of English sentences or Spanish sentences or, or whatever. So can we say that when a new language is created, there's also a new culture? Um, I think that language and culture are symbiotic. And yet, so yes, I agree that uh, to have a new language is to have a new culture. To have a new culture is going to require changes in the language. Um, so it depends. If the new culture is really radically new, it's going to require a new language. If it's a modification, it's going to require modifications in the language. And modifications in the language uh, will cause modifications in the culture. Um, can we? So the, another question is from Alejandra. Um, what do you think about the hypothesis that language evolved as the means for manipulating attention, a way to have a shared attention which is exploited by culture? Um, in a sense, all these things, all these answers and questions point to the same thing, that um, our cognitive abilities um, re led us into closer contact with one another, led us into, into larger societies with more complex cultures, and we needed ways to communicate and to, to show attention, to communicate across a range of meanings. So language and culture evolved together to show us this. And sure, language has many functions. It can help us focus attention on something. Although, as you can see by a hunting dog, um, you can focus attention on a bird for the owner to shoot uh, without language. I mean, you, the dog's pointing is an index that, that actually is a sign that the owner, the hunter, interprets as, oh, okay, there's a bird right there. Its tail and its nose is forming an arrow pointing to a bird. Um, so, so that's not language. It's a form of communication. So we can, language serves a, a variety of functions. So, um, is there any evidence, uh, this is from Pedro, is there any evidence of common first sounds around different languages, races, geographical regions? Well, historical linguists, uh, the thing about historical linguistics is that um, uh, most historical linguists would tell you that it only goes back about 10,000 years. So to reconstruct sounds, um, you know, we, we know pretty much how, um, how Latin was pronounced because it's not that old and because it has all of the descendants, Spanish and Portuguese, Romanian, uh, French, uh, Italian. Uh, so we can sort of reconstruct how it was sounded. We sort of know how Proto-Germanic was pronounced because we have English and German and Frisian and, and other Germanic languages spoken today. But, but Latin and Proto-Germanic are only about 3000 years old. And then you go 
uh, back to Proto-Indo-European, which is about 6,000 years old. We can sort of understand the sounds there. But to reconstruct what Homo erectus language would have sounded like, um, this would be quite difficult. However, we can say that if they could produce E, A, uh, and U, they would have because those are the symbols that are easiest to hear. Those are the vowels that are easiest to hear. And they would have also produced bilabials because those are easy, uh, pa and ba, and they would have, you know, they would have produced a range of sounds um, given their vocal apparatus. We, we're not fully sure what their vocal apparatus was capable of, uh, but if they were capable of the range of sounds modern humans are capable of, uh, they would have uh, made words that sounded like words of uh, a number of languages and probably the simpler sounds to start off with, just um, bilabials and alveolars and velar sounds. Um, so we can't reconstruct that. That's a million years old and we can only go back 10,000 years at the most, uh, but that's a good question. Um, uh, Rafaela, since in your perspective, translation is not always possible, what would you say should be done with literary works? Well, in literary works of the, um, of the Western world, which includes Spanish and English and, and French and Latin and German, Germanic, we have this shared culture so that if I were to compare um, uh, Mexican culture with, or, you know, with, with California culture, well, I mean, California came from Mexico, so actually was stolen from Mexico. So uh, we find, we expect to see a lot of similarities, but um, if I compare, you know, New York culture with French culture, Parisian culture, uh, what we find is European cultures are pretty similar. And so it's not going to be that difficult to translate from one European language to another. But even so, we find difficulties. So poetry is very difficult to translate because poetry requires both form and meaning to be kept very tightly uh, together. And that's a, that's a special challenge. But if we go to um, much more distant cultures, so, so the prediction is it would be more difficult to translate um, you know, uh, Chinese poetry into Spanish than it would be to translate English poetry into Spanish. Difficult also to translate Hebrew poetry, but Hebrew is the language of the Old Testament and we've been working on that for thousands of years. So we have a great amount of familiarity with it. So, so you know, often people say, what's the hardest language to learn to speak? And my answer is, it's the language that's farthest from your native language. Um, and, uh, you know, all languages are hard. They're all extremely difficult to learn and you have to live in the culture. So um, if you want to learn to um, to speak Spanish, uh, you need to live in a Spanish speaking community. You can learn some of it from books. I mean, every, every um, you know, when I was growing up in California, Spanish was required from third grade on. But the only reason I learned Spanish and, and you know, I, I don't speak it as well now because Portuguese got in the way. But um, the only reason I learned it is because all my friends spoke Spanish. I mean, 80% of the people in my schools growing up were Spanish speakers at home. And so it was just a natural part of, of language. But you've got to be surrounded by the culture. You've got to understand uh, the culture. Um, how do we have to teach a new language? I'm proposing the lexical approach because it's focused on meaning rather than grammar. Uh, this is from uh, Sitlali. Um, well, I think that's right. I think, well, grammar is important, but I think that you want to get people to know what the meanings are. You want to get them to interact in natural situations and learn how people categorize the world. You know, I mean, um, if you think about an English speaker learning Spanish or Portuguese, the ser versus estar distinction, this is really hard, for example, for Americans who don't have this distinction in English, you know, we just have is. Um, and so I remember that when I was in Brazil watching a soccer match and uh, Guarani, a team from the state of Sao Paulo, won the Brazilian championship. And um, the announcer said, Guarani é o melhor time e está o melhor time. And I couldn't understand why he would use ser and estar in such similar ways. It took me a while to understand the semantics there. And to understand that, you have to understand something about the perspective of the speaker. So yes, grammar is very important, but um, we all have many examples in our experience of people who had reasonable grammar, but didn't know how to say anything because they didn't understand the meanings. 
Um, how come pitahas don't have rituals? Aren't rituals language? Um, well, it depends on how you define a ritual, but there doesn't there's no evidence for uh, for rituals in pitaha. I mean, there's evidence of repeated behaviors, but not uh, larger rituals that are symbolic. And why don't they have them? Um, it, they just don't seem to uh, need them. I mean, it's not a cognitive deficiency. When I say that the pitaha don't have X, it doesn't mean they can't have X. If I say their grammar doesn't have X, it doesn't mean they can't think about X. It just means they have chosen not to have that particular sign. Rituals are symbols, and so you can choose the symbols your culture chooses to express, and rituals are one form of symbols. Um, Another question, can you explain how Pita Haas expressed future events? Um, sure, so I may say that um, I go now, all right? Well, I'm still sitting here, but when I say I go now, it means I am going. Uh, it's a sort of future thing. You know, if you think about English, it doesn't have a future tense, right? There's no future tense in English. We have a past tense, I go, I went, we have present and past. But where there's no form of the verb for future, we have to use this particle that indicates intention, I will go. And that means future in English, but it's not a future tense. So there's no way to mark future tense on the verb in English. Um, we have to use these separate uh, auxiliaries. Um, uh, so English really only has two tenses, past and present. Um, Pinaha doesn't have any tenses, but it can tell whether the action is complete, which can often lead to a past interpretation. Um, you can say another water, um, I return. Okay, well, there's no future tense in there, but the fact that you said another water, which means an annual cycle of the river rising and falling and return means I'll come back in a year. Uh, so without tense and without even many words for time, they're able to say, I'll come back in a year. Um, so that's one way that they, they communicate future events. Uh, Francisco asks, babies and their mothers communicate through rituals. Could you say a few words about it? Well, babies and their mothers definitely um, communicate. Um, they use, uh, Pinaha have different channels of speech. So for example, there's hum speech where people can hum to each other and communicate anything. There's whistle speech where you can whistle to one another and understand anything. There's yell speech. Um, and there is a musical speech, which sounds like they're singing, but it's actually just a modification of the tones and the rhythm of the basic tones of the language. Um, every one of these channels of discourse has its own communicative function. So mothers, caregivers, not just mothers, but anybody responsible for an infant tends to hum with that infant when they're together rather than speak to them using consonants and vowels. Men in the forest, when they're hunting, whistle to one another. They can say anything whistling um, that they can say with consonants and vowels, but when they're hunting in the forest, they tend to whistle. Uh, so all of these have their own function um, and, and these take the place of, uh, of rituals uh, for them, or you could interpret them as rituals. Um, I mean, they're prescribed forms of speech that have a particular context in which they function. Um, here's a question. Your field work showed that Pitaha does not have a recursive structure. If my understanding is right, it is because Pitaha people simply do not need that complex structure. The fact that there is no recursive structure in Pitaha does not necessarily mean their cognitive ability is inferior. Am I getting this right? Yes, that's absolutely correct. So. If I say, um, you know, my interpretations can be recursive even when the language is not. So I can watch you go out of your house and go talk to someone and, and um, take another path to the grocery store and come back and talk to somebody else and then come in the house. So my picture of all the things you've done is recursive. And if I were to tell it to you, I, I could use recursive structures and syntax, or I could just give you a series of non-recursive short sentences, but my mind is working recursively. One of the reasons that people find it difficult to understand how you can have complex thought in a language without recursion is because we think that language is always connected directly to interpretation, but it isn't. A lot of language is vague and ambiguous, 
um, and leaves the interpretation up to the context. And in the new book that I'm writing, um, I am going to be talking about overt compositionality, uh, you know, structuring the meaning in the syntax largely, and covert compositionality, where the syntax just gives you clues, but you construct most of the meaning uh, in your head. And so the Pinaha construct very complex meanings in their head, uh, but they don't express them very in a very complex form in their sentence structure. Uh, but that isn't their cognitive, you know, again, when I'm with the Pinaha, they, they feel sorry for me. They think I'm cognitively inferior. I don't know the names of any plants. I can't hunt, I can't fish. All the things they consider to be absolutely crucial for survival, I'm no, I'm no good at. So they feel sorry for me and they think, uh, um, you know, he's Dan's a nice guy, but he's kind of stupid. Um, so here's a question from Marco. Would the constantly growing size of human social environment contribute to grammar to arise from meaning? Um, if so, why do you think this would happen? Would it be then a consequence of more complex social affordances? I do believe that as society gets more complex, the meanings that we have to express get more complex. And as the meanings get more complex, you know, so for example, different sources of knowledge, linguistic knowledge, engineering knowledge, beer making knowledge, I'm gonna have a beer when this is all over. And uh, this is all kinds of knowledge that requires special vocabularies and using um, special grammars, special grammatical forms uh, makes retrieving the meaning much easier. So yes, I expect, um, you know, there could be very, uh, you know, cultures just like the Pitaha that have very complex grammars. In fact, there are. There are many languages in the Amazon. I've written a, a 500 page grammar of one of them called Wadi. Um, uh, this is a group that lives in the, in the Amazon as well. And they have an incredibly complex set of recursive structures. Um, in, a, in a, an environment very similar to the Pitaha. So uh, the Wadi are no smarter than the Pitaha. The Pitaha are not smarter than the Wadi and the Americans are not, you know, North Americans are not smarter than either one of them. Uh, it's just a, um, it's just a series of choices on how to represent symbols, how the symbols should be enhanced and encoded in the language in such a way to enhance uh, interpretation. Um, with globalization, this is from Ethel, uh, from globalization and our needs to communicate with others. Can we say a new language is being constantly co-created? Uh, we are always adapting one another's languages. We are changing each other's in, in every conversation. We change our language, we change our cognitive structures. Uh, we adapt all the time. Um, you know, I think that when we see, um, you know, a president like uh, Trump in the United States, he has, He's changed the English language, not necessarily in ways that I'm happy about, but uh, but people start to talk like this. And, and, and that's not even globalization. That's just a political leader in a specific country. But as we have greater globalization, um, we do, um, one of the things that globalization does is produce more homogeneity. And that's an unfortunate side effect. It removes uh, diversity. The strength of our species is um, our diversity. Um, our ability to survive and thrive in this world depends on us having thousands of cultures and thousands of languages. And through that, we are a richer species. And, and the more that, you know, if I go live with the Pinaha, I'm a richer person. I was a very narrow-minded uh, Christian young man when I went to live with the Pinaha. And now I'm a narrow-minded atheist. Uh, I mean, they've, they've changed me dramatically uh, and, and brought about uh, a richness in my life that I would not have experienced without them. And my time growing up on the border um, uh, in Mexico and, and all of my Mexican friends and going across uh, to our Mexican doctor, Dr. Montes, um, and learning about UNAM when I was a boy, these things enriched me tremendously. Um, and the experiences I've had teaching in many other countries in Brazil and Germany and and England, all of these things uh, enrich us all, and they change our language, they change the way we think, they change the way uh, we construct our cultures. Um, um, so, so one question is from Constanza, what do, you, to, what do I think about the motivation of language evolution? Is it collaboration or manipulation? All kinds of complex motives come into human uh, interactions. Uh, when we talk to each other, they can we can be communicating 
with uh, great mutual respect, we can be communicating with disrespect, we can communicating with one more powerful, the other weaker. All of these cultural relationships enter in and into and affect our language. That's why language is so complicated and why culture is so complicated and why you can't study one without studying the other. Uh, language is not math mathematics. Language is a living, breathing thing that is coming out of us. Um, and, and you think about all the things, you know, um, uh, Jose Borges, uh, you know, talked about why is there no word in any language that he knew about for the sound? He says, so in the evening, when you call the cattle from the field and uh, there's a cowbell sounding and the sun is going down and you see all the cattle, why is there no word to capture what you're feeling right then? Um, well, it doesn't mean we're inferior or not for, for not having it. We just, nobody's thought about a word. I mean, if we th stop and think about it, just this little space between our heads and our ears where we can sometimes put pencils. Um, what do we call that space? I don't know of a language that has a word for that space. It's a nice little space to have. You can carry things using your ear, um, but I don't have a word for it. I mean, my glasses are in there right now. If I didn't have that space, I couldn't be wearing my glasses. Uh, so I'm glad that it's there, but I don't have a name for it. Um, let's see, um, about the cognitive complexity, Karimi, uh, do you find some relation between mental verbs and pitaha and some additional meanings such as epistemic ones? Well, here's the interesting thing about pitaha verbs. There are about 90 verbs, only about 90 verbs, but they can all be combined like letters of the alphabet. And with those, when you combine them, you can add 16 suffixes. So they have this incredibly complex verb structure um, with only 90 verbs. So they build epistemic meanings from context and from combining these verbs. Um, so they can say, I believe, and uh, you're lying, and uh, I, I'm, you know, I intend to do this. Um, but they do it without having verbs specifically dedicated to that purpose. Um, there's a, the final question is from Patricia, um, or uh, I think it's Patricia, uh, is thinking and imagination a product of language? How can we do such activities without the aid of language as a tool to extend the temporality and spatiality of events? Well, we know about past tense and future tense because we got up yesterday and we're living today and we expect to get up tomorrow. So we have, we don't, these aren't tenses, but these are n knowledge of the meaning of past. The, all human beings have the meaning, know the meaning of past, the meaning of present, the meaning of future. Not all human beings choose to mark them in their language. So in English, again, we mark past tense on the verb, we mark present tense on the verb, but we don't mark future tense on the verb. That doesn't mean um, um, English speakers can't talk about future. Uh, it doesn't mean that Spanish speakers who have future tense on the verb can talk about future better. It just means our languages have taken on different lives and they used to be the same language 6,000 years ago. You know, I mean, Spanish and English, 6,000 years ago, there was no distinction. We were just the same language, Proto-Indo-European. And now along the way, we've made choices and we've uh, made our languages into uh, different things. So. Uh, language is a wonderful gift that we have. Meaning is a wonderful gift. It's an ancient, ancient uh, possession of uh, human beings, Homo erectus to Homo sapiens. We're all human beings. Um, and it is our privilege to be able to have lectures like this because uh, you have learned English. Um, and if I were a better person, I would have spoken to you in Spanish. I'm I just can't believe I grew up on the border and sp all my, you know, I used to play in a, in a rock and roll band that we played on uh, with, where I was the only non-Mexican in the band and we played on uh, TV in Mexicali and Tijuana and places and, uh, and we played at Mexican dances down in Mexicali and stuff and, uh, and I can't believe that I, it's been so long that I wasn't able to give my talk tonight in Spanish, but thank you for your patience and thank you for having me. It's been a wonderful privilege to visit with you this evening. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Dan. Uh, I think there's just one little question there. I don't know if you still have time to take it. Uh, it's, it's from sure. Noe Bravo. Um, what would be the main function of language, communication, or thought? Oh, oh right. OK, so that's the question that Chomsky rose. I think that more and more evidence suggests that um, the function of language is communication. 
In my model of language evolution, that's certainly the basic function. There's actually some recent and extremely interesting work by um, psycholinguists at MIT and another one at Berkeley, Steve Piantadosi, who's at in the Department of Psychology at the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, Ted Gibson, and we've written papers together, so I know them both really well, and Ted Gibson at MIT. And they've written papers together with experimental evidence that the, uh, in, in their opinion, that the primary function of language is communication and not uh, expression of thought comes along as a secondary fact. Um, oh, so here's the, another question. What do you think about the language police we have in the Spanish, um, meaning the Academia de la Lengua? Uh, well, uh, we have language police all over the world. You know, every most countries have. I was invited a few years ago to talk at the Brazilian Academy about changes in the Brazilian language. And um, uh, I, I was going to go and a lot of my friends protested and said, you can't, you can't humor those people. They're not good for the language. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it is funny, but, you know, everybody wants to think that the uh, you know, language has to be one way and not a, another, but it's flexible. And, and you won't find Spanish spoken the, uh, the same way by um, uh, Zapotecos and Mitla uh, as you will by, um, you know, more European descended uh, Mexicans in Mexico City. Um, and the English that I speak growing up in a farming community in California is not the English that is spoken um, at the university that I teach at. I adjust my English to fit the expectations of my uh, colleagues at the university. And when I'm back home with my brother, who's a, a blue collar worker, we talk differently. You must be some, somewhat tired, Professor Dan, because you had another uh, lecture before this one. Um, but could you take one final question from Santiago? Sure. Um, yeah, Santiago, I see that. I see that question here. Uh, Santiago says, how would you describe your experience when you're talking, you're using all the cultures and languages that you know, or you're using just English? Well, consciously, well, even unconsciously, I'm primarily using English. Uh, I notice that when I speak Portuguese, when I'm in Brazil, um, my intonation changes, obviously, my hand gestures change, the way I hold my body changes because now I'm communicating to Brazilian friends in a very different context. And when I'm with the Pitaha, it changes again. But there is a sense in which all these things that I have learned in all these different cultures and countries has made me a different person. I'm not the person who went to the Pitaha uh, in 1977, you know, 43 years ago. Um, I talk differently. I think, I think a lot differently. I act differently. I look differently. So, so we're fluid over time. In my book, Dark Matter of the Mind, I take a sort of Buddhist approach to how we come up with our concept of our person. If we think about it, we are just a set of memories held to a set of experiences held together by memory. And, and that is our identity. Um, and the memories can be false. So who are we really? Um, but I do believe that, um, that who I am today is, is in large part the result of all the people that I've known and all the cultures I've lived in and all the languages I've heard in my life. Whoa. Um, you have such energy, Professor Dan. You have taken so many <laughs> questions. We are really grateful that you've uh, made this effort to be here with us. And I think that could be it. You must be very tired after two lectures in a row. You, you must have been <laughs> speaking for about, what, uh, maybe four hours, uh, I am sure. Uh, yeah, before this, I was speaking to, I was giving a lecture uh, to a, a college in, in London. So, I mean, only with Zoom can I be in London uh, in the <laughs> afternoon and Mexico in the <laughs> evening of the same day. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Dan. Um, I think we're going to close this lecture with this. Uh, you, you have a beer next to you uh, waiting to be consumed. I have my own. Yes, if, uh, there you go. Negro, mo <laughs> Negro <laughs> modelo. <laughs> yeah. so I, I think I'll have a beer too. I'm thinking about you having your own beer somewhere in this world. Yep, so. I'm, I'm going to go from here and uh, sit at my table and enjoy my Negra Modelo. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor 
uh, then um, we'll be sending you some other messages via email to keep in touch. And hopefully we can have, you can host you next year or in two years. I'm not exact, sure exactly when here in Mexico, if, if, if we can arrange something to make you come, that would be wonderful. Thank yeah, you. So I would much. enjoy that very much. So keep me in mind. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah, yeah. We, we do. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much, Professor Dan. Have a very Buenas nice noches time. a todos. Yeah, thank Buenas you. Buenas noches, Profesor. Uh, Buenas noches. Gracias. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you so much. Por nada. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Thank you. Uh-huh. Thank you so much. <laughs> really worth attending. Uh, really worth attending. Uh, excuse me? Daniel, really worth attending. Oh, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, então, uh, tudo de bom para todo mundo e boa noite para todos. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Thank Professor. You. Uh, I think he's gone, so we're going to close this. Gracias, Sergio. Uh, gracias, gracias, maestras. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the link for the certificates is already in, in the chat since a little while ago. I'm going to post it again in case somebody still hasn't uh, seen it. Just give me a moment, please. Um, there it is in the, in the chat in case anybody um, still needs the link. And thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. We'll keep in touch. Thank you, Professor Sergio. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Well, I'll finish this meeting and we'll be in touch over the week. Thank you so much. See you later.